over it. There we go. Um, so this National Open Call for Art, the American Women Feminist Futures that we put together um, came about in Hera's 50th anniversary year this year. And for our 50th anniversary, we were thinking about how we could reuse or recycle or revisit past exhibition titles that we've used in the past 50 years. So the one of the first exhibitions that was up at Hera Gallery was work by two founding members called um, The American Woman. So we put this together, but wanted to revisit this in a context um, where feminism lies from 1974 to where it is now in 2024. What has stayed the same and what has changed? So we put this call together and we asked artists to use feminism as a framework to document, re-envision, and reimagine what the American woman and American womanhood could look like in the future. This was one of our most popular open calls for art that we did. We had almost 800 entries um, and only 28 pieces were selected. So um, we hope you feel as honored to be in the show um, as we are to have you with us. Um, there's a really diverse um, group here in um, all different ways, and it's really expressed through just these different pieces of work that we have. And I think this image here really shows that from these assemblage pieces um, and found object pieces to some pop art and um, contemporary drawings and contemporary um, painting. Um, as one of the oldest feminist art cooperatives in the United States, um, we are really looking forward to celebrating this milestone and our honor to have um, all of you here um, working working with us um, in celebrating this year. Um, so I have a long statement from the juror that I just want to quickly read. Um, Amy Smith-Stewart, the chief curator at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum, selected the 28 pieces for the show. Um, and she just wanted to note that it was an honor to be a juror during this year. The American Woman Feminist Futures commemorates this major milestone by revisiting its first exhibition in 1974, 50 years later. A national open call to all feminist artists, the work submitted show how feminism has evolved, no longer captive to biology, as trailblazer activist and author Bell Hooks famously, famously declared, feminism is for everybody. And so feminist art today is fluid, free, personal, and vast. The sentiment is demonstrated in the selections, which express a great range of sensibilities with themes and content indicating that visionary feminist art is an active, vibrant, and fully committed as it ever was. Um, and if you want to read this full statement, it's available on herogallery.org with the rest of the virtual exhibition. Um, so up first, we have our first artist, Valentine April. Hello, everyone. Um, so nice to be included. Um, this, um, this piece was done, as you can see, in 2019. Um, when I created this, um, I was thinking about, um, well, it's funny that um, the juror chose to use the word vast in uh, her, her statement because when I was working on this, um, I was, I started thinking about the vastness of, um, racism and the, the, the deep effects that it has, um, on people, um, not just those who are, um, um, victim to it, um, but those uh, perpetrators and also unknowing perpetrators. Um, and um, this is this model I've actually known for uh, over 20, 25 years. Um, 
and recently came to see her every day uh, a few years ago. Uh, and we had some very many uh, discussions um, about racism and her experiences and my observations. Um, so, I, and, and that wasn't even what I set out to talk about when I, when I started this piece, you know, I, I often work in a way that I start something um, because I don't know, there's some like inkling of inspiration somewhere based on the way something looks or how something makes me feel a person, whatever. Um, and, and then, you know, like as the painting progresses, the, the, um, the purpose kind of grows. Um, and that's what happened here. Um, so, you know, and then also thinking about stardust and, and dust to dust, um, Etc. And I, I wanted her to be looking at us um, as if to say, you know, what are, what are we going to do? Um, I think I, unless, I, I think that's pretty good unless, uh, um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Appreciate it. And thank you so much for including me. Thank you so much. Um, next we have Marilyn Artis. Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm from Oklahoma City, and I actually traveled to see the exhibition in person. And uh, the work is so impressive and so honored to be included uh, among so many fabulous uh, feminist pieces of, of art. And uh, it was just such a, a great, a great deal to see everything in person. So this piece I started, I live in a red state. And uh, I'm a liberal that liberal feminist that lives in a red state, and that's a whole you know whole different thing uh, than folks that live in uh, you know more liberal minded states. So our our legislature was passing these personhood bills, or attempting to pass these personhood bills, and I was also uh, on the board of Planned Parenthood of Central Oklahoma, and I began this piece when you know, these ridiculous bills were starting. And um, I worked on this piece for probably two years. It's all tiny, tiny little X stitches um, that make up this body, this woman's body. And it's stitched on canvas, on uh, vinyl, and then stitched on a bed sheet that my husband and I slept on. Um, but I put it down after probably working for two years on it. And, uh, you know, I got busy. I got doing other pieces and I kind of wasn't sure how to finish it. And so, um, as we all know, Roe v. Wade fell and I picked it back up again. And it was kind of how I dealt with um, my rage and horror and um, heartbreak and finishing this piece. And, uh, you know, I tried to have shades of pink because those are, you know, people instantly know I'm I'm talking about women. But obviously, when you look at these this piece, I'm obviously um, talking about reproductive rights. So, um, yeah, it's a big piece. It was a crazy. It took. I wished I'd counted how many hours it took to make it. But um, yeah, that's what I have to say about battleground. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Um, next, we have Mariana Baker. Oh, I think you're muted. There we go. Oops. Just keep muting me. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, that's a, my fun piece. So, <laughs> um. I'm actually from the liberal state. I'm from uh, California, so South California, although it is a little bit more conservative than LA because I'm coming from Orange County, but uh, because we live next to university, UCI, uh, so it's a little bit better. So, And um, yeah, I'm very proud that I'm from a um, more liberal state, actually. When I hear the previous... <laughs> Um, statement is just kill me to think about all these things. I mean, all their 
abortion rights and what's going on in the country. It's, um, but we have a good news. Trump was uh, um, guilty in 34 counts today. So it doesn't relate to my work, but it is um, a positive news. So um, my piece called Amanda is on the run. So I don't know if anybody pay attention. It's a little bit um, by um, shot an angle, but it's actually in the middle. It's a, a pussy. <laughs> so in a way, I first call it Femina, but then I thought, no, I just want to something more fun, something more playful. So, and this is start all serious about this Amanda girl who um, liberated girl who came from another planet. And I have a series of work uh, in a different, like three dimensional and two dimensional, tell the story of this fictional girl. Because in some way, maybe now I'm thinking of that, I wanted to maybe kind of get out of this crazy world a bit and get into this fantasy world because the world now, the world is now is not fun. It's definitely not fun. It's, um, it's a very difficult situation in the world. And as a feminist and as actually immigrant from Russia where, you know, I run from the totalitarian and, um, you know, trying to find a, a better world. So maybe this Amanda is trying to find that better world now, you know, with what we go, we have in um, Middle Middle East and um, in in Ukraine. So I think it's in some way maybe some kind of escape for me. <laughs> so um, and uh, it's I try to make it very colorful, but it is a statement in some way that of the power of women power, of fun of women power, not only strength, it is strength, but it's all also uh, a fun, a powerful statement of, you know, of solidarity some way. So yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you so much. Great. Um, next we have T Chai Beer. I'm sorry, Sydney. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Taya Che Beer, pronouns she, her. Um, this is one of my pieces I've made uh, during the tenure of my grad school here at Boston University, which I just graduated from, We uh, called How Do I Keep? Um, so my practice explores the multiplicity of the self um, through layered drawings and paintings. Um, I'm currently using translucent substrates like poly silk, um, but occasionally real silk and rice paper as well. Um, I'm a cisgender, but I'm queer and mixed race. I'm Korean and white, and, and I'm clearly an American. Um, and so I move, I feel like I move through the world fluidly. I shift and adjust according to my context or my perception by others. So I use self-portraiture to try to embody the slipperiness by exploring the complexities of my experiences across various situations and affects. Um, so in this piece in particular, I was thinking about, I think as women, I was raised to feel like I could only express myself in a certain kind of way, or maybe thinking about how women are exp uh, portrayed in art in certain kinds of ways. So I was thinking about, I've been thinking a lot about trying to expand that um, in my practice here with, you know, grief, consoling, um, solidarity, anger, frustration, a lot of different feelings. Um, so my paintings begin with stacked drawings, um, suggesting movement of different moments in time, multiple feelings, as I just said. Um, and then I build a uh, working wet into wet on my translucent substrates like poly silk with water-based media, like mainly acrylic paints. Uh, this results in stains that complicate the kind of initial frameworks. They echo the translucency of my substrate um, and they further invoke notions of indelibility, fluidity, plasticity. Um, plasticity, I mean more in the neuroplastic sense. Um, and then as the layers of stains continue to build upon themselves, um, obfuscating earlier passages, I use a denser paint to, to, to draw out, excuse me, select moments of um, clarity. Um, so through the porosity of my substrate, because it's unprimed, it's poly silk, which is basically plastic. <laughs> it's kind of like what we wear in our clothes sort of thing. Um, every gesture that I make, whether intentional or accidental, like if I spill the paint, it is what it is. Um, so every gesture I make becomes permanently embedded in the painting's body. And I think I think about uh, this in relation to how this parallels our lived experiences, particularly as women in this world. 
and how actions, words, deeds become a part of who we are and how we relate to others. Um, so thank you so much and for including my work in this show. I'm really honored to be included with everyone here. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and next we have Andrea Borsik with two pieces. Um, so let me know when you want me to move on to the next one. Okay. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm coming from Santa Cruz, California, and I wish I had seen this exhibit in the flesh, but here I am um, in my studio, surrounded by works that I've been um, engaged with for 35 years. And this particular piece on view, I was really excited to um, participate in Hera's history um, and this exhibition in particular. Um, and this piece in particular, which comes from a larger series of works um, that were called the Tarot Cards of Life that I had made that year, uh, which included um, 48 images um, that were all about asking what makes us mortal? What are those moments in life that make us feel human? And uh, I pulled out from this tarot cards of life, uh, the images that were most poignant to me in terms of women, and this is called women's work. And the images, it's hard to see here, uh, range from um, childbirth to um, falling in love, to getting arrested, to seducing another and pleasuring oneself, and then more mundane activities like washing the dishes. Um, and because I worked in this case in multiple images and cells, they, they told a story. You could either read it from left to right or just focus on one image. It could be something as banal as women waiting online at the market. Um, I didn't know that these were going to be tarot cards uh, or turn into tarot cards. I had just made the images. And then one night I had a party um, with some girlfriends and I randomly gave everybody a a card and they had to write what they thought the meaning was. So for example, um, one might be getting arrested and somebody said captivity. This card is about captivity and its alter ego state freedom. In what ways are you being held captive in life at this time? What holds you back? What are the tethers made from? How can you move toward a greater sense of freedom? So my friends defined these for me after I had actually painted them. And I feel that so many of these are still relevant. Um, these images are still relevant and I think they'll still be relevant in the future. Um, they're made on handmade um, Indian paper. They're what, five by seven um, in gouache paint and the, the tarot cards are for sale. <laughs> I made a series of them. Um, so those are, that's what those are about. And then the next image is um, called Suit of Suffering. And this is made on um, rice paper with a um, soluble pencil and some white ink. And it's the image, it's kind of a life-size image of a woman who's maybe celebrating um, or balancing on one leg in kind of a compromised position. But over her is this, um, this sort of uh, the suit that has, uh, creates maybe a barrier or a shield for her. And I think a lot of us walk around with one of these to protect ourselves. It's a protective device for how we go through life. Um, so that's, that's what I was thinking about in this piece. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and next we have Alexandra Bowes. Alexandra, are you with us? Thank you for including me. Um, I've enjoyed uh, hearing what everybody so far has said. 
I'm also from California, a liberal state. And this uh, I painted when Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, and uh, it's sort of self-explanatory. I feel like we've gone backwards, even though, you know, you find joy every day and we're all lucky that we are able to create and get amazing pleasure out of what we do. But it's still ways personally uh, on all of us and um i was shocked i think you know even needing the word feminism at this point you'd think we'd be kind of in a sense beyond that and we're back to another time that uh i, I just think i don't get it um so that's what I was thinking of when I did this. And again, the pink color represents women. Um, uh, most of my paintings are abstract, but they're narrative, really. Um, I think about something in a story or something that's bothered me or the environment. I see women in the environment and the earth is the same thing, Mother Earth, and the way we're destroying that and the way we aren't respecting women and even, you know, um, Chief Justice Alito blaming his wife for the flags or whatever. You know, it's just we're still in the same spot and we're all so capable and the world would be so different if we were in charge. But that hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, anyway, that's my, you know, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra. Um, next we have Marsha Halfmans. Marsha, are you here? Okay, I think we can come back if they, they joined. Um, so next we have Jana Lynn Kidd. Hi, I'm I'm so sorry we aren't able to hear about Marsha's work. I was really curious about it, um, but I'm very happy to be here um, with this group of um, incredibly talented people. Thank you for the honor of that. Um, I, um, this is a piece, um, as you can see, uh, sort of based in coiled basketry. And, and what you maybe can't see very well is um, if you look into the sort of into the vessel, um, there are a lot of sharp pins. Um, and um, I, with this piece in particular, was just exploring um, uh, some, some kind of opposites about life, about, um, feeling desire and also wanting to protect um and feeling soft and hard and pointy um and i think a lot of my work is sort of exploring boundaries um and much much of what i do is about speculation um which kind of fits into this um i think some of the things that you were speaking about as you were introducing the the show itself um, and in particular, speculating on a future biodiversity. Um, so where there isn't a lot of categorization, where we don't maybe have to be thinking of ourselves as um, uh, as as labeled, but really as um, as something other uh, and something bigger, something that sort of defies all of that. And I think at its heart, feminism in some ways is about that and maybe has evolved into that, I would hope. <laughs> um, I'm sure not all, all of it, but um, when I think about sort of the feminism that I grew up with, um, I'm, I'm 53 and um, the um, sort of heart that I have for the feminism of the future, it really is it's about um, something that's bigger and more inclusive. Um, and so, um, uh, and that's a, a bit outside of this piece. This is one of many where I'm speculating on a lot of those ideas, but this piece in particular really is about um, what it's titled, this full mouth full of wants. So this idea of desiring and wanting, um, but also 
uh, and attracting, but also feeling armor and protection and uh, some of those uh, uh, challenging opposites that are part of being human and particular part of being uh, female in this world today. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak about my work. Thank you, that was great. Um, next we have Carol Kunstadt. Hi, everybody. So nice to be here and to celebrate Hera as being 50. It's really remarkable what was started back then has continued and we're part of it. So um, this work has many levels to it. I mean, uh, visually, it's very seductive. It's made with repurposed fur, uh, fox, raccoon, mink, all that probably was on collars and uh, coats, you know, decorating it. Um, and their antique irons, which date back to a more laborious life and possibly domestics in homes and um, referencing slaves who were, you know, domestics in homes. Um, but the coherent um, paper, which is part of this series, is from a book. And the book dates from 1791. And it was written and published in London. And you can see on the tops of these irons some of the paper that I've woven and cut and attached. Um, and it was anonymously published because it was written by a woman who originated from Bristol, the UK. And the connection of her work and her words to these objects for me is very significant. And that is that, you know, in her time, there was no word such as a feminist, but she was a champion for educating women and believed deeply in those concepts that women should be lit literate and it would improve life, not only in the home, but in society if they were educated. And she fought her entire life to abolish slavery in the UK. And so she used her talent as a writer to um, distribute pamphlets and she worked with somebody in parliament so that when he was writing uh, bills or laws, you know, to encourage the abolitionist movement, she was getting the word out to the public at the time. Um, and I just by chance came across her. I bought this book for $20 in a uh, antique store in Connecticut. And when I, you know, checked all of the title and the date and everything about it, I saw her name and I had no idea who she was. And um, yeah, so this work is a homage to her, but also to all of us that we need to keep our voices loud and clear and to press on with what business has to be done. And that's what this work is about, totally. <laughs> thank you, Carol. No, thank you. Um, next we have Joe Lobdell. Hi, hi, uh, I'm Joe Lobdell. Uh, this is my daughter, Esme, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a toddler that uh, is not going to bed. Um, I wrote down some thoughts just because my brain is a little, uh, distracted at the moment. Um, but I'm so excited to be a part of the show and uh, it's great hearing from everyone. Um, I'm based in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and um, so when I was growing up, uh, my grandma taught me how to make yarn dolls. Um, she was an occupational therapist who used craft projects to help her patients exercise their fine motor skills. Uh, this experience taught me the empowering potential of crafts and the act of making. 
Uh, my practice is deeply rooted in the inheritance of objects, skills, and ideas from past generations. Through this pro process of acquiring and transforming these elements into uh, acquiring um, and transform, I transform these elements into new forms. Uh, this piece is a part of uh, my series called uh, You and Me Makes We. The process involves preparing fibers for natural dyes and crafting them into yarn dolls, which is quite labor intensive and physically demanding. Um, constantly moving water around and bundling yarn um, and alternating between uh, batch preparation and individual doll crafting. Uh, and so each doll turns out unique, yet there are these uh, moments where they harmonize through color, form, and texture. Um, and that's what excites me um, is how the dolls blur distinctions between them. Um, through through this like merging of the colors and the, the fibers. Um, and in this process, I'm exploring uh, creating forms that convey gesture and the illusion of holding weight despite the material being very light. Um, and it's a reflection on the physicality of care and of our inter, uh, interdependence on each other. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Joe. Um, next, we have Paula Manns. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be participating in the exhibition, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I am an artist based in Washington, D.C., and uh, my main medium is mixed media collage. And before I start talking about this piece in particular, I thought it would be good to talk about my practice. Um, I really use collage as a means to explore the way the identity was formed for Black people in the Atlantic, right? Those of us in the diaspora that were brought to the Americas, to the Caribbean because of the transatlantic slave trade. So um, during these historic processes, enslaved West Africans were thrown into the bellies of the ships and they weren't necessarily people of the same cultural, of the same region, of the same religious practices and language. So I often see collage is emblematic of the processes of all these dispersed people coming together in this constricted environment and going through the real labor of forming new identity by um, molding together these fragments, right, of their own identities to be able to thrive and ultimately survive in the new world. So that's what really draws me to collage. Collage, I really view creating and constructing these um, Black figures that are almost of uh, mythic proportions, right? They're large, they take up a lot of space, they have a lot of agency because I view blackness as um, an expansive as universal identity as um, boundless and ultimately global because I view the black body as an expansive body. We are people that were quite literally birthed um, in a bridge, right? In a portal between the new and the old world, right? We are the fusion of the West and of the old world. So that's really lies at the center of my practice. Now this piece in particular, really speaks to, I guess, my contentious relationship with feminism as a Black woman, right? I often view feminism as uh, complicated by the lack of reckoning with intersectionality. So throughout my, you know, as a, my journey to begin to understand the role that feminism plays in my own identity, I often gravitate towards Black intellectual women thinkers and writers that really contemplate um, the intersectionality of gender and race, right? Gen racialized gender, right? So I often gravitate towards Bell Hooks, Lucille Clifton, Alice Walker, and especially Audre Lorde. So there's a particular poem by Audre Lorde called Dahomey that talks about, talks about um, Dahomey was an ancient uh, West African kingdom that started in the 15th century and spanned all the way until the beginning of colonialism, right? And in this kingdom, what was so remarkable about this kingdom was that there were Amazon warriors, right? The, the armies were composed entirely of women. Um, and there's a film that just came out with Viola Davis called Woman King that talks about that. So it's really talking about um, as a black woman, not seeking, not rooting my identity in the West, right? Really going back through my ancestral processes and and um, using West Africa as the reference for my feminine identity, if that makes sense as a black woman. So that's what that piece is about. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, and next we have Rachel Merrill. 
um, with a video piece and I can play a short clip of the video before you talk, Rachel. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds great. And stretch the right and left and right and left and reach to the ceiling with those arms. Keep reaching up and up. You're going to feel it along the entire side of your body. Reach it up, up, up. Now bend the knee and plie on down. Just spread those knees apart and slightly bounce and separate. Start warming up the legs. You should feel an inner thigh, outer thigh, and the whole calf area. Now, with the knees bent, reach to the right and left. Reach it to the right and left, right, left, right, right. Your knees are still bent and you're just reaching each time a little further. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Roll up, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Forward, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Roll up, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and we do have this whole video um, up on the website as well, if you want to look at the whole thing. Um, All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for working out the details and the bugs with this whole video that we had. Um, so I started a project about 12 years ago um, related to um, competition and how um, in this world, I'm still competing with everybody and myself. And I find that utterly ridiculous because I, it's that sort of like competing in. So I found myself competing in motherhood, in marriage, in academia, in all these ridiculous things. Um, so. Uh, my work is video output, but I make all the costumes and I make the props. And so I knit and crochet and I sew and I make all these uniforms for these characters. So um, the less than is the second in a, in a three part series of it's always a competition. Um, the less than came out of um, two things. One was my Son was diagnosed um, with a mental challenge and that I was working through that at this time. And um, and I also had a critique with someone who told me that I was only 85% of an artist. And at the time I thought, oh, okay. And I, I took it, I took that and I was like, okay, 85% of an artist. I don't know what that means, but I'll go with it. Anyway, so I stewed on that for a while <laughs> and I thought, what does that even mean 85% of an artist? And so the less than group, these characters are, so the first set are ones that you aspire to. They're all about a minute long. They're based on high intensity interval training, sort of minute long like video of these different characters doing things. But the less than are sort of the heel, they're the, they're the sort of the othering of. Anyways, I knitted and crocheted in these outfits, 85% uh, less than symbols. I just went full bore into this. And then each of the characters do these ridiculous moves um, alone by herself, uh, trying to perform and keep up with everybody else. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's most of the work. And then the output is then a video um with oftentimes the props or the the costumes on display as well thank you rachel oh. i can get to the next slide there we go um and next we have rebecca tetmeyer hello everyone um thank you so much for setting this up and i'm honored to be um, part of the exhibition and included with all um, these great 100% um, artists, um, not just 85%. Um, so uh, during the pandemic, I had started hand sewing data visualizations. Um, the broader topic has centered around inequities of motherhood. Um, it has now expanded to um, the inequities um, and um, risk against our womanhood and reproductive rights in the US. Um, so the first piece, I'm gonna bring up my details here. So the, the first piece on 
to the left, looks at the number of women with children under the age of three, working across all occupations compared to those in low wage, minimum wage occupations, their marital status and who falls below the poverty line. So this reveals that more than half of working mothers with young children in low wage jobs don't have spousal support and 33% of them fall below the poverty line. And the data is retrieved from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the National Women's Law Center. That was an earlier piece. Um, the one on the right is my most recent piece as I started to think about um, how sex education is factoring in to um, the restrictions on our reproductive rights. Um, so this um, piece called Sex Education and Reproductive Rights um, is a hand-stitched proportional area chart in response to the many restrictions put on reproductive freedoms across the U.S. and how sex education factors in. So sex education is determined at the state level and isn't always mandated nor does it cover conversations about sexual consent is what I revealed and uncovered in looking at each state's um, policies on sex education. So the data for this visualization is retrieved from um, SPECUS, which is a um, um, policy organization specifically for sex education in the US and the Guttmacher Institute. And thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and next we have Lehuani Wapaani, um, if you're here. I believe Lehuani is coming from Hawaii. I'm not sure what time it is over there right now. But maybe we can circle back. Okay, um, so next we have Morgan Ford Willingham. Might not be here either. Okay, so we can circle back again. Um, let's see if third time is a charm. Um, actually, we are circling back to the beginning of the alphabet for Erin Adams, um, whose slide was missing, but it's back. Um, so Erin, if you're here, you can take it away. Hey everyone, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm a little <clears throat> congested and I'm gonna try to talk. And I think, um, first of all, um, I'm honored to be here with all of you and to, have my work in this show is um, a perfect fit, in my opinion, for my work. I've been working since the 1980s. I live um, in Los Angeles. I went to undergrad in 87 here at Otis, and then <clears throat> finally was able to do graduate school and finish that in 2021 during COVID. So it's been a long haul, it's been interesting. And along the way, I've been just um, amazed and inspired by so many different women artists who keep on just working and doing amazing um, things, even though our <clears throat> lack of representation is pretty extreme, especially as far as collections go. Uh, in the United States. And this is what inspired this group of work. Um, the two pieces that I have in the show are both um, from the series. Uh, Anonymous is a woman artist. And there are, I think, 12 pieces so far. Um, they're all based on women artists who've inspired me. And they start out as collages which are collected from the streets of Los Angeles. I go out and <clears throat> collect museum street advertising posters and I stack them and then collage them and then do paintings on top of them, sort of putting us into the conversation that we're sorely lacking uh, space in. So that's the basis and all of these women artists are people I know, I've had conversations with all of them. 
the series started with um, two or three artists all having a conversation about our representation. And this was in 2017, I believe. So by 2019, we're starting to get statistics and seeing that it wasn't just us complaining, it actually was really true. And so the Burns and Halperin report can, you know, specify the exact statistics. But I use that as a launching place for um, this series. And um, so it's collage work first and then painting on top <clears throat> and underneath the collage. And I also do sculpture as well. So it's just an interdisciplinary uh, career over the course of 35, 40, almost 40 years. So feminism, feminism is at the heart of all of it, for sure. Well, thank you thank so much, Erin. Um, so now I think it's time that we can open our Q and A. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Um, I can, I'll scroll back through the PowerPoint, um, and look at some images as we talk about them. Um, and I think I'll pass it over to Marissa, um, to open our Q and A for us. Hi everyone. Um, Marissa, um, and I wanted to ask a question um, about Janelyn's work. Um, when I first saw that piece, uh, I was really uh, intrigued by it. So I was just curious about um, your process and like just um, how you decided to use the pins. And I believe there's beads on the pins and just all of that. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I'm so glad it was intriguing. It's sort of meant to be that. <laughs> meant to be both intriguing and then you're sort of like, oh, what's going on here? Um, but I, um, uh, my, my background actually is in drawing and painting, which um, to me over the course of my career always felt like it was one of the traditional big arts you know, mediums. And um, I started experimenting with fiber arts, um, mostly because um, it was what I was taught as a young woman growing up by the matriarchs in my family. And um, there's something that's really lovely and tactile about creating with wool. And um, uh, it's, it's sort of this kind of soft, lovely um, aesthetic experience. And I appreciated the, um, the sort of um, history of coil basketry um, and, and the craft of that. Um, and so the intention there was to sort of use what is typically been um, craft work which is is often um, categorized <laughs> as as women's work um, and move it into something that um, feels very different from that it has sort of another purpose um, and so the the beads are a bit like um, sort of you see the flashes in nature that are meant to be um, seductive and so a little bit of polish, a little bit of zing to draw you in and the softness and you, it, it it's sort of the intention is like, I want to explore more. I want to see what's inside the cavity, inside the mouth. Um, but when you get really close, you see that there are these sharp pins. Um, and so it became this exploration of um, sort of softness and beauty, uh, as well as in seduction, as well as um, kind of armor and protection. Thank you so much for that insight. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. Of course. Uh, open it up to anyone else with questions. I've forgotten the name of the video artist that did. Are you, do you see that your work is funny? Yes. Yeah. It's, okay. yeah, yeah. It's intentionally supposed to be funny. Um, but as we all know, art and humor is always a tricky 
a tricky thing. So, um, but yes, it, it's meant to be laughed at. Um, and at the same time, it's generally a little punchy. And so that's sort of the, the line I try to ride is, can I make it funny where you can laugh at it? And then at the same time, can you get some of the other parts of it too? Thank you. I think um, a few of these pieces have a little bit of humor in them as well. Um, like Mariana, I'm thinking of your work here and um, I know you giggled a little bit when you talked about what's inside of this. Um, do you want to speak to why humor is important in your work or maybe it isn't and just kind of happens? Well, it's very important. Uh, I do improv. I do stand up comedy. I always thought that humor is a, is a very powerful way to deliver the message. So that's why I, you know, I and I I also write there. I love to create this imaginary world, and um, you know, uh, and I think witty is very important. You know, it's. Um, it's a strange name. Uh, I remember my husband asked, why would you call it like Amando Naran? What does that mean? I said, exactly. You know, that's what I want you to ask. I want to, to you know, to you to, you know, to be curious. So, yeah, so that's very important to me. So the sense of humor. This is like slightly off topic, but I just have to share this with an art group. I was at the Philadelphia airport this weekend and they had an exhibit up of local artists and there was um a piece of um it was a bunch of leaves and objects from nature into this like little map sort of thing and it was a photograph of this like you know um a small little nature installation I guess and the title was wouldn't it be weird to be a worm on here or something um and I just thought it was just like so funny and so interesting, like this beautiful piece, um, just like so intricate with these patterns and designs. Um, but I think just showing like, you know, humor makes it so accessible and um, having these funny thoughts that we do have as humans, but then bringing it back to these really important topics on feminism, or climate change. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, and I know that um, Marsha was in here today as well. Um, but these are, um, I forget how many there are, Marsha. I'm not sure if you remember. Um, so all of these um, pieces that you see here are about one inch thick and they um, climb our nine foot ceiling um, and written on them or, or hand stitched on all of them um, are phrases or, or expressions um, from people who wrote in from U.S. jails. Um, so this piece is really captivating as well if you can make it um, to the gallery in person. Can you read some of the um, messages that are on there? Um, I don't have any other photographs of this um, right now, but I can definitely take some and um, share them with you. I know we're just running at the end of our time, um, but I, um, Paula Manns, um, I was really connecting with um, what you were speaking about when um, you were sort of addressing kind of finding your place in, in feminism. Um, and how that's evolved. And that's something that is um, kind of close to my heart as well. And I wonder, um, you know, outside of looking at some of the incredible writers that you have, like Audre Lorde, um, 
and uh, and I can't think of the other two that you mentioned, but I, I just wonder how, um, what are some of the other ways in which you've found feminism to evolve and have found a place for yourself in it? Um, I think for me, the most radicalizing experience has been motherhood. I think that mm. it really- can, I, I can't I, hear clearly. I mean, it- Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. I attended a seven sisters school, which was a very um, feminist environment, but I, I can say that nothing really radicalized me as much as raising a child. Um, and the experience of really coming to grips with how pervasive gender roles are and how that plays out in domestic life and also public life, right? As when you become a mother, you are quite literally a public target for all policing of gender roles. So, um, and um, it's just been very fascinating to raise a, a femme presenting child in this world with this new positionality that I have thinking more deeply about not just gender, but also how my racialized identity impacts that. And um, I think writers have been a great way to get out of my head and into the head of others, which is why I often use that as um, a really big reference because they have uh, a way of intellectualizing my emotional experience and, and giving it weight and girth and all of these things and allowing me to to think beyond my own experience and making it look looking at it more in a universal sense if that makes sense I don't know if that answers your question but I don't think that I will ever be the same as a result of raising a child um and I think people often talk about motherhood in soft terms but I don't think they talk enough about how politicizing that experience can be and how radicalizing it can be Thank you. Um, so with that, does anyone want to add a last comment about the future of feminism? Um, we've had some great quotes about diversity and inclusivity um, of where this fifth wave of feminism is going. Um, I don't know. I think it's always interesting to hear different perspectives, um, especially from these artists in this show, um, looking back on 50 years and projecting into the future. Well, I um, I have one last thought. Um, as you can imagine with the piece that I presented, I'm really interested in, in finding um, or you know, seeing how um, the, I don't want to say, how, huh, and, and seeing how a feminism can embrace um, inclusivity and, you know, in a deeper way and, and what that might look like going forward like how can we um how can we grow into that more fully that that's what i'm looking forward to um, seeing and um, exploring i think how can we have power how can you know it just feels like it, the clock has turned back and you know, oh. I think it's all very frustrating personally. I Just a brief, <laughs> from, my por from my perspective, um, when I was an undergrad in the 80s and it was very male dominated uh, landscape of even being able to get in a show so I feel like on the positive side, I really wouldn't have gone back to graduate school or made all the efforts that I've made in the last maybe eight years, unless I saw some potential there for at least being able to be in shows and um, have the work seen and progress. 
I um, agree. And, so and that, Otis, I'm excited about that. But, and like I said earlier, um, when I began this series, I feel like um, very little has changed, if not in terms of the collecting habits of all of these institutions. There's about 32 of them in the United States that are major uh, collections, either in museums or institutions. Very little has changed. In fact, it's gotten just a little bit worse. So it, I'm going to you know, just say, I'm going to continue to do the work no matter what. I'm an artist. That's what you know, I do, but it is frustrating sometimes when you can't, um, the representation just sometimes isn't there in terms of like, if we have a time capsule a hundred years from now, does it even look like we existed? So that drives me forward. <laughs> Definitely. And Otis though, wasn't the conversation with Judy Chicago and Sheila de Brettville and all that at the time you were going. And so they were thinking about it. And that was a long time ago, really. Well, yeah, I knew them and I know them still. Sheila's my, I'm related. Okay, very good, interesting. Yeah, no, um, I just went to an amazing show that was put together by Suzanne Lacey at Red Cat uh, yeah. in Los Angeles. And it was just a spectacular feminist show based on the collection of CalArts from the eighties. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people are thinking about it, but we're still at the very beginning of getting the kind of representation that is anywhere close to equitable, anywhere close. So, but I'm excited for that <laughs> to see that that's finally happening. And the dialogue is good too. I mean, there's dialogue now. There wasn't the same amount of dialogue Exactly, yes. <clears throat> well, thank you so much um, for joining us all tonight and sharing these thoughts with us. Um, coming up in June, we have our um, Girl Art Now virtual artist talk. That's our virtual year-long exhibition on our website and on social media. So we hope that you can join us um, on June 20th at 7 p.m., on Zoom as well. Um, again, this is recorded and will be on our website. So if um, you can't make it in person, definitely check that out there and share this um, with your friends and family and networks. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.